Hello, everybody. So we're back again, and we have a really interesting presentation and a couple of uh, presenters from from the Portuguese world uh, to talk to us. The name of the presentation is, or, or the title is Organizing Ecologies of uh, Human, in brackets, Abandonment on Portuguese Wildfires by Professor Leticia Fantinel from the Federal University of Espírito Santo in Brazil and Veronica Policarpo from the Institute of Social Sciences at the University of Lisboa in Portugal. So both, both sides of the, uh, of the ocean. And um, I think we are ready when uh, Leticia is ready, which I believe she can uh, start sharing her screen, if that's okay. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Leticia Fantinel. Uh, as I was presented before, uh, thank you for that. Uh, I would like to begin by uh, thanking the, the opportunity of being here talking to such an interesting audience, especially to our sponsors and organizers that support and dedicate in order to make this encounter happy uh, and happen and happy. Thank you very much for that. So, um, Okay, uh, as I said, let me pass this. Um, as I said, I'm Leticia. I work at the Federal University of Spirit Santo in Brazil. I have a background in management and organization studies, and that's why you'll see me speaking of organizing practices and organization and management practices, because this is my main research interest. It's not the disaster or even the animals, but I came into this subject by the organizations. Uh, I focus on, on understanding how organizations and animals relate to each other. So this communication results from my postdoctoral research in which I had the privilege to work in collaboration with Professor Veronica Policarpo, who coordinates the Human Animal Studies Hub at the Institute of Social Sciences in Lisbon, Portugal. I don't know, Veronica, if you would like to introduce yourself now and then you, you can get the floor mm -hmm. again. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm Veronica, as Leticia said, and it's a privilege to be here uh, two years after the first conference. Uh, and I'm, uh, my background is sociology, so that's my main approach to this topic. And for the last years, I've been uh, focusing on animals in disasters in a couple of projects. And yeah, and well, I was fortunate enough also to have Leticia working in these projects as for one year in her postdoctoral research. Back to you, over to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So uh, this study was developed within the framework of two research projects. Uh, the first one is Liminal Becomings, coordinated by Veronica, and the other one is People and Fire, coordinated by two other uh, researchers from the University of Lisbon. Both projects were funded by the Portuguese Foundation for Science and Technology, and I want to express my gratitude for, uh, uh, to the coordination of these projects for providing us with valuable data and access during this research. So um, I'm past this one. First of all, we begin with this scenario of extreme climate conditions that we face. All the world is being affected by its consequences, as we see. And uh, in Europe, some of these consequences. Um, you're cutting are... off, Leticia. We can't um, hear you. No. Now, now you hear me. I don't know if you have some yeah. problem with the internet. Yeah. I can hear. I can hear. Yeah. I can hear you fine. Okay. So maybe I'll. Stop sharing my screen. Okay, you're no. fine, Leticia. Keep okay, going. Okay, you're doing okay. Fine. Okay. So uh, this is the scenario. Uh, in Europe, we have uh, some of the consequences are the mega fires, uh, which in Portugal are becoming more and more common. So in 2017, uh, the country had one of the most severe fires in terms of damage and loss of lives. The affected territories were mostly agricultural territories and forests. And I think it's important to mention that we have significant transformations in the Portuguese territory in the last few decades, such as the aging of the population, rural exodus, uh, changes in animal exploitation, changes in the vegetation, the rise of uh, monoculture cultivation of eucalyptus. So all these have given rise to very complex multi-species landscapes, and we understand them under the label of ecologists of human abandonment. 
This is a concept from geography that describes territories and environments transformed by the progressive human absence after long periods of human intervention. So we think this could be a, a good lens to understand it. So um, we discuss how human and non-human animals and their relationships are affected by situations of natural disasters, such as wildfires. More specifically, we investigate how animals are remembered and seen in organizing in response to wildfires. So how they are considered or disconsidered in prevention, rescue, and re reconstruction practices. How can they contribute to the resilience to disasters to uh, multi-species communities. This is our main interest and objective in this research. So for that, we engage with three main th uh, theoretical perspectives, which are the first one, organizing practices. This is my background. Uh, the, the second one is uh, disaster management. And finally, multi-species studies. And we end up with this construct that we call the multi-species organizing for disaster management. And that means uh, we have at least three commitments or assumptions. Uh, the first one is that our focus is not on the organization as an institution but, uh, or a structure or uh, something like that, but rather as a process. That's why we talk about organizing practices, because we understand this concept allows us to capture the complexities involving different entities and agents rather than organization. The second assumption is that we consider organizing not as a strictly human practice, but as a multi-species practice. And this is not something self-evident in management and organization studies, I have to admit. We want to challenge this reductionism in literature and in practice uh, in considering that organizing practices concern only to human domains and interests. So we consider organizing as a multi-species organizing. So this is not just uh, from human world. And the third assumption is that although animals are highly impacted by disasters of all types, Disaster management structures are mostly human-centered, as we've seen, as we have seen at this conference, and um, animals are mostly considered when human safety is under risk, as we have seen. So, like when tutors or owners refuse to leave their animals behind, for example, as we, we have seen uh, uh, in the previous uh, 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 speak. So it's important to understand the levels of vulnerability that animals and humans are subjected, uh, not just during the disasters, but also in normal times. So this is our background here. And um, as I said before, our research was conducted based on the data obtained from the, from the People and Fire project. This was a research project focused on developing and testing an analytical framework to support the development and evaluation of forest management and public policy towards fires in Portugal. So uh, data collection took place in 2021 when online workshops were held with local stakeholders from four municipalities located in the Pinhal Interior region. Uh, this is a region uh, very uh, problematic from the, uh, the, this point of view. Uh, it's most affected by fires. Uh, and as you can see, right in the center of the map, this is Portugal and the region, you have uh, the zoom over there. So uh, the project did not include references of animals initially, but we could incorporate some questions in the workshops about the topic. So the questions concern the animals affected by the fires, the measures taken um, concerning, concerning these animals at the time of the fires and after the fires. Uh, possible solutions are key issues that people consider that should be included in public policy and the role, the role of animals in risk reduction and territory management. And uh, then we recorded the workshops, we tra transcribed and coded the data according to qualitative content analysis. Here we present the data in terms of what practices towards animals uh, were cited in the workshops and how different species appeared in the workshops. So uh, what are the practices? 
In terms of our data, we present practices that were cited when we asked about actions taken by humans towards animals during fires. So uh, we have here some initiatives, usually in informal or poorly coordinated. I mean, when we ask, what are the actions taken towards animals during fires? They say, well, we, we, try, to, we try to save animals, uh, we try to calm the humans, and mostly that's it. So the other question was, uh, what do you do after the fires? What do, do the community do after the fires? And then they, then they said, well, uh, we have voluntary veterinary support. We have euthanasia when necessary. We have food distribution for bees uh, or other animals that need. But many other actions cited here were not specifically focused on animal, animal welfare, as you can see. We have activities such as digging trenches to bury animal dead, uh, dead animals, such as uh, uh, an action, in, uh, it's a matter of uh, by security, the replacement of animals like bees, sheep, or goats, financial support to beekeepers. I mean, these actions involved dead or alive animals, of course, but always as objects or mostly always as objects of actions that aimed at human interests. So uh, when asked to suggest proposals for actions during and after wildfires, the most common suggestions were also human-centered. It was like humans who lost their animals must have psychological and financial supports, farmers must have the replacement of lost animals, but I think uh, it, it's important to highlight other interesting ideas that appeared that are focused on the causes of the wildfires. I mean, like education of human beings for fire prevention, the need to reorganize the landscape, something like the best idea to protect animals from mega fire is precisely not having mega fires. So I think this is, uh, this, is interesting, this is something interesting that we, um, we are going to come back later in this presentation. And how do animals appear? In terms of that, something that we consider important is that we don't know exactly how different species are affected and how many individuals are affected by fires. This is something very important because we think if we can't quantify the losses, how can we plan public policy? So this invisibility is a symptom and also a part of the problem. Uh, Another interesting fact is that different species appear under different classifications. Wild animals were mo most remembers, remembered as victims of fires. So, however, the effects of fire uh, on these animals are still opaque. The predominant idea is that living animals on their own would be the best way to deal with these effects, as if human actions could only dis disturb a supposed natural regeneration. On the other hand, exploited spe species like sheep and goats were mentioned not as victims of the fires, but as replaceable resources. Uh, like any other loss, as you can see uh, in the line over there, uh, as we heard in, in the workshops. Companion animals, uh, or the so-called domestic animals, it's interesting that they appeared less in the cited, uh, in the workshops, mostly in terms of their link to the rescue of humans. And finally, some species were mentioned as pests. This is very interesting because uh, they were mentioned like, like animals that affect human life uh, in an undesired way. I mean, like rats, for example, when you have the fires are wild boar. They were cited, the, the most cited species uh, were cited as animals that are not exactly victims, but species that appear in villages in search of food because of the fires in the forest. They don't have the food anymore. They don't have the environment anymore. And so they go to the villages and cause con conflicts with humans. Wild boars were the species that most appeared on the, uh, these uh, workshops. So uh, something interesting that emerged from the workshops uh, are the term organized ordered to describe what 
the forest should be in order to prevent mega fires. Our informants say, say uh, that a disorganized forest is bad for the animals or that a disordered forest uh, disorganizes animal populations. Organizing here emerges, and we think this is interesting, uh, as a practice that balances the territory and also involve some uni some some animals and we think this is this is interesting veronica are going to take the floor from now and maybe uh, talk more a little bit from uh, of this veronica if you want thank you leticia sorry oh sorry sorry <laughs> this one yes so we are um Moving on to the to this to, to the final part of our presentation and a striking result of our study and I think this draws from everything that Leticia has been saying and it's not surprising at all actually uh, unless by how strongly it still shows in our data is the fact that the vulnerability of non-human animals and the humans involved is deeply entangled correlated in many ways. And this means, of course, that in order to understand and address the vulnerabilities of animals, we will need to address the social living conditions of those humans living in those territories as well. And this is hardly being done. Uh, on the one hand, this is closely linked with the pervasiveness of a certain ambiguity, and this is well known uh, of animal scholars, uh, this ambivalence towards uh, the role of non-human animals and the place non-human animals have in humans' lives, in this case, in the practices that constitute the disaster management cycle. For instance, while separate goats are reckoned as needed in land management, when it comes to acknowledge their role as active contributors, the role may be belittled on behalf of the human counterparts, in this case, the shepherds. Moreover, such an ambivalence from our point of view uh, is a kind of a resistance to acknowledge animals' active contributions. Uh, and it also shows in a certain distrust in the ways humans relate to nature, so-called nature, inverted commas, namely the exploitative ways. In this quote, for instance, this interviewee challenges the assumption that hunting practices may cause or disrupt um, certain species distribution, in this case related to birds. So next slide, please, Leticia. So as a conclusion, uh, we would like to highlight what we found to be a pervasive result in the Portuguese case, at least, uh, the fact that these ecologies of abandonment are themselves interspecies. They affect both humans and non-humans, and it seems that uh, even though the measures taken to address the impact of fires are highly focused on humans, they do not protect all humans after all. Those living in very isolated rural places with poor economic resources, often women, seem to be systematically forgotten by the public policy and entities once the emergence phase of the disaster is over. The question would then, uh, we would then like to raise at this point is, uh, would considering the entangled vulnerability across species actually be a more effective strategy to managing fire, even considering only humans, which we do not want to, but even if we had to, wouldn't it be much more effective? And finally, we ask in maybe a provocative way, what if animals can contribute themselves to the organizing practices of disaster management, uh, precisely by disorganizing them? An interesting example in Portugal is that of wild boars, who are already disrupting human regulatory ways of living in these territories in several ways. Then to conclude, we are arguing that as far as disaster organization and management is centered in anthropocentric or human-centered structures and practices, challenging them is key to include animals as active contributors. And animals themselves may contribute creatively to this process precisely by disrupting such human-centered practices. So this is the way we, an idea we would, we would like to finish with and open up the discussion from now on. And um, this, these are our references, a few references, cited references, and thank you all for your attention. And 
we very much look forward to hearing your insights. If you want to share anything with us, thank you so much. Thank you very much to both of you. Um, it was a really interesting presentation and you have a couple of interesting questions here. One of them is asking for your contact information. And the other one is, uh, if you can read it, it says, do you think you find your finding would be different in the same study? Would it be done in the Azores? Veronica, maybe this one is more for you than for me. <laughs> our, contacts are, uh, our contacts are here, but we can put it on the chat as well. Okay. Great. Um, yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Gerardo. Well, the Azores is a very different uh, weather. So it rains a lot in the Azores uh, and wildfires have a totally different, uh, it, it's totally different there in terms of wildfires. The main disaster the Azores uh, faces uh, often is landslides. So they do have a problem with volcanoes, of course, volcanic eruptions and landslides. So the, the, this project was, was conducted in a specific area of Portugal, which is in the central north, and which actually uh, burns a lot uh, uh, every year or every two years. Uh, and mega fires are becoming more frequent. Um, and yeah, the, it's a totally different approach, I would say, in the Azores. There's another question about uh, our, our uh, background. I'm not, I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure I've answered totally to your question, but I'd, I'd be happy to continue this discussion in a different forum also. And I am not a veterinarian, and uh, I don't think Leticia is as well, <laughs> not from a previous life. Not that we hadn't thought about it, but we still hadn't the time to study for that as well. I hope you can hear me, but I lost uh, the audio. Um, I, I just meant to ask uh, you, the, the two of you, if you could um, elaborate uh, for a minute or two about the, uh, the concept of entangled vulnerability across species. I believe this is worth um, developing. I think this is one of the key ideas of our work here is because we understand that uh, we are subjected to conditions that affect not only humans or not only animals, they affect us all. And we are absolutely entangled in our relations and also in the hazards that we suffered. So. I think this is this is something uh, very important to us. That's why we understand that uh, uh, even when we we think about the the, the management practices toward fires, uh, this is very important to understand that we we are in the very complex environment. So uh, we are all entangled. I don't know if, if Veronica wants to add something. No, it's it's totally what you've already said. Maybe could I add some examples? For instance, in Portugal, in the region that we studied, it's quite frequent to have dogs in chains. Uh, to, so th these some of the rural houses are very isolated, and dogs are chained there to uh, uh, protect the houses. So in a way, so they say. But the fact is that not only do they they, they're not able to protect anything because of being chained, but also that fact uh, not only puts at risk the, the lives of the dogs, of course, but often of the humans as well. And I think we've come across these, these kind of examples, and I'm sure we will come across these kind of examples further uh, in, in this conference. But even the fact that sometimes people go back or they don't want to, to go away because of the animals or they go back to danger dangerous places because uh, of their uh, companion animals that they don't want to leave behind. That's also a form of entangled uh, vulnerability. So we think that this okay. entangled, okay. No, 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 I'm just clearing my, my voice. Don't worry, Veronica, sorry uh, about that. <laughs> okay, I don't want to take too much time. Uh, it's just uh, uh, adding some examples to what Lutis already said. Thank you very much uh, to both of you. This was a, a fantastic presentation that, that deserves more um, more thoughts uh, about uh, trying to to uh, clarify concepts for the people out there, especially the different audiences. 
Um, the next session, sadly, will begin in a few minutes. We will end this one, this session, so it can be saved as, as a recording for the future for future publication. And please sign back um, to hear uh, um, to hear the next one. Uh, this conference is made free uh, to view and access thanks to the generosity of our sponsors. But to keep it free, we invite you to donate via our website, jadmc.org. Thank you again, Leticia and Veronica. Thank you very much.